Hello everyone and welcome to a new video in our interview series and today we are interviewing Jackie. Before we get into it and let Jackie introduce herself though, a couple weeks ago we did launch our new ambassadors program so if you haven't checked that out do so already we will link it down below for both our website page and the intake form if you wish to apply. Let's go! So as I mentioned, we are here with Jackie today. So Jackie, if you could please introduce yourself for us. Hi, and thank you both for having me on this video. This is really awesome. I'm really happy to speak with you guys today and you guys are doing amazing work. So I uh, love watching your videos. So as, uh, as mentioned, my name is Jackie. Um, I am 36 years old. I live in Toronto and I was born uh, with a very serious heart condition. It's actually one of the most uh, common congenital heart defects in babies called Tetralogy of Fallot. Uh, but um, it was, for me, it was a little bit different because I had a very rare form of it called a Tetralogy of Fallot with absent pulmonary valve. That impacts about three to 6% of babies born with Tetralogy of Fallot. So, uh, how it all happened is that when I was born, I wasn't breathing well. My parents noticed that right away within the first hour or so. And the hospital kept saying, oh, she's fine. She's fine. And then my mom was going, no, no, there's something wrong. There's something definitely wrong. So they took me away. And then I was born some, something around like 7 p.m. By 11 p.m., my parents had the news that I had a serious heart defect and likely wasn't going to even make it through the night. So it was pretty awful news for my parents. I mean, for anybody that's hard to hear when your child is born that they're facing a life-threatening situation, but my mom and dad tried for four years to have me. So it was like a, finally this miracle baby after going through some treatment and then all of a sudden they don't know if I'm gonna live. So uh, I did survive obviously, cause I'm here talking to you guys today, but um, the first few years were really, really difficult. I was in the hospital more than I was at home and uh, Tetralogy of Fallot, I can't exactly explain everything that's wrong with the heart. If anybody's interested, they can look it up on the Mayo Clinic website. There's a really good description, but um, the absent pulmonary valve meant that I was missing my pulmonary valve, which causes blood flow to flood into my lungs. And because of the blood flow flooding into my lungs, I had an hyperinflated low. So the biggest um, problem that I had when I was very young as a toddler baby, toddler and all that, was that the hyperinflated lung would get infected all the time. So if you know you had your average cold, somebody came to my house, for example, with a cold, I would get sick right away. And then I'd end up with pneumonia and I'd be back in the hospital. And this was on and off for the first four years of my life until... I had my tetralogy repaired when I was four years old through open heart surgery. And I also had a pulmonary valve put in, obviously not one that lasts forever because it's not permanent, but it was a human valve and it only lasted four years. And then I had to go in for another valve replacement, even though the rest of my condition was corrected. Still didn't do all that great after the valve was replaced because what happens with kids with my heart condition is that we end up being very small and we have issues growing, issues gaining weight. Um, and so every calorie that I took in, I burned off like two. So when I was 11, uh, with consultation with my doctors and my parents and other uh, kids who had this, I actually had a tube put in my stomach to feed me while I was sleeping um, as an extra meal that I would get basically through a can of Ensure that would be put into a bag run through a pump and then put into my stomach. And I was hooked up to this pump pretty much every night for 10 years. Uh, I had the tube till I was 21. And at that point they took it out. They had to kind of, I had to have surgery to like, I had surgery to have it put in, but then I had obviously surgery to have it taken out. Um, and so even though my heart was doing okay, like that was still the issue there. And then after the tube was taken out, I needed another heart surgery because the valve that I had put in when I was eight years old uh, was starting to fail. And by, by this point, I was in my early 20s. So I was in university, getting ready to graduate and getting ready to start my career. And uh, 
I was learning, oh, great, I'm starting my career and I have to have heart surgery again. And funny enough, as it all occurred, it happened to be the big year of the financial crisis, 2008, that I graduated. So here I am trying to start a job in this economy that's really bad and I'm facing heart surgery and know that I'll have to take time off. Uh, so what ended up happening was that there had been a new procedure that had been going around for a few years. Um, it had been performed in some Edmonton hospitals and in some other hospitals, I'm not quite sure, I think all around the world. And it was the kind of procedure where they can put a new valve in through a catheter rather than going in through open heart. And I was, I think about the 500th person in the world to have it. And um, it was pretty, it was, it was, you know, it had some risks. It wasn't, I looked up the studies and nobody had died from it. So that was great. Uh, but it did have a little bit of risks. And I remember going in for that procedure and the doctor said, you know, if, if all goes well, you're going to be out of here in two days. If things don't go well, you could die basically. And I was like, okay, great. <laughs> um, but honestly, it was the most, it was the best procedure. It was uh, that I could have done. They said to me that I get one to five years out of this heart valve. I am going on 12 now. Wow. <laughs> so um, it was the best thing I could have gone through. And it took me two weeks to recover. I was literally at a club dancing two weeks after that heart. <laughs> so That's nothing could have stopped me. Yeah, nothing could have stopped me. So that's basically what's happened with my heart condition. But my lungs, unfortunately, are still not in great shape. Um, they would never be in bad enough shape for a transplant or anything like that, because it's only really one lobe in one lung. But it means that I can get um, asthma, like I, I have asthma like symptoms, and I can get much sicker than the average person if I pick up a cold. It doesn't mean that I'm more susceptible to illness, but it means I'm more susceptible to a bad illness. So for example, if I were to catch COVID, I would probably die, yeah. which is why I'm getting my vaccine tomorrow. So I'm very excited about hey. that. Um, but yeah, that's the main thing that we still have to watch out for is I, that, and I will need more uh, heart surgery again in the future, but they're not sure if I can have that procedure again, or if I have to go through open heart. So we'll see. But right now there's no sign that I need it yet. That's amazing. Absolutely incredible. Congrats. You've over overcome so many crazy yeah. wild things. We kind of know what it's like to have a uh, little bit of scare in those first when you're born. Yeah. I mean, both of us obviously uh, won the genetic lottery over here. Mm -hmm. You have a kid whose eyes are shaking like crazy and a kid whose face looks this beautiful. <laughs> And so, uh, yeah, we understand kind of being in and out of hospitals a little bit. Um, how have these kind of challenges, obviously it's a little bit different in a pandemic, but how do these kind of affect you on a day-to-day -day basis and do they ever kind of limit you? They did limit me back when I was growing up. So I didn't, much like things are right now, I really couldn't be exposed to other people because I was so likely to get really sick. So as a kid, my parents would get home from a place, they would sanitize like everything. They would, my dad wouldn't even be able to hug me until he basically went and took a shower and changed his clothes and everything. If he was out working, if he took, if he took like public transit, um, it, uh, literally it was a lot like things are today. I'd have to spend weeks out of school if there was an illness going around. Um, so when COVID started, this was like, oh, this is kind of old hat to me. I'm used to this. Um, so it did limit me. And because of that, I had a hard time making friends. Uh, it was hard. I was only in school part-time my entire life. I never, ever went to school full-time. Uh, in the end, because I was a really good student in high school, they ended up fudging some credits for me because they were like, well, she's doing really well. She's an honor roll student. Let's just give her like the gym credit. So I got my food bed credit and I didn't even ever set, set foot in the gym. Um, but so it did limit me. I did have a lot of trouble in social situations. Uh, I didn't have any siblings. My parents never ended up having any other children. So I was very much, I became friends with adults. I became friends with people who were much older than me or much, much younger than me because those were the only people I could relate to. I couldn't really relate to outside of my few close friends. I could not relate to people my own age. Um, so that was probably the biggest challenge was with that and then with dating it was really really hard too because um guys in high school were like they were not interested I was badly wanted a date so I wanted a date so badly nobody was interested in me they knew about my health situation it was very scary to guys finally I met a guy in university and that was when online dating kind of started 
And he, in the end, ended up pretty much brushing me off because I had a health scare and he was bullying me because of that. So that was tough. I lost a few other guys uh, because I told them about my heart condition and they ran. So, Mm -hmm. you know, at that time I was at least making friends and like university, I finally became really social and I had a big group of friends and I would go out to clubs a lot and I felt normal in that way, but it was still really hard with dating because guys would, they would be like, or they'd only want, you know, one thing, like they're, they're interested in, you know, what, and they're like, well, we don't want a relationship with you because you have a heart condition. So that's probably how it impacted me the most. Today, it doesn't really, I don't actually think about it that much. And um, I feel totally normal, if that makes any sense. Like, I don't feel like I have a heart condition. Mm-hmm. And obviously, the the other ways would be that I'm not as physically strong as someone maybe my age is. Like I, but I have taken up a lot of fitness. And I did start lifting weights a few years ago. And that has helped. But still, like, there's I can't like sometimes get out, get up a flight of stairs without like huffing and puffing and all that. And, um, I can't carry it. Regular people do that too. Like (laughs) I'm an athlete and I struggle going up the stairs. Like it's ridiculous. Well, it depends on the, it depends on the height of the stairs, right? If they're really, really tall stairs, like I live in a townhouse, the staircase is not fun at all. The staircase Mm -hmm. is awful. (laughs) That's awesome. Um, yeah, those definitely some barriers that, that that I think other people can relate to having mm-hmm. trouble social in social situations. So um, for potentially some people who may be like that, are there ways that you kind of use to to cope or overcome those struggles? Well, my mom was actually part of an organization of families who's all had kids with congenital heart defects. So I made friends with a lot of other people uh, who, who had not my defect exactly, but similar defects and had similar childhoods. So, and we were, we actually had a preschool almost where it wasn't really preschool. Like we just had a climber and we did crafts and stuff like that. I don't think it was real preschool, but it was for kids like me so that we didn't have to worry about germs with other kids. And we only were brought there if we were absolutely healthy. And, uh, so I made friends through that and I actually still have a few friends, uh, from those days, two of my friends have been friends with me pretty much my entire 36 years. Um, and one of them actually does have Tetralogy of Fallot, which is interesting. He has a slightly different version than I do, but, um, he and I remain friends to this day. We're very, very close. We talk all the time and, um, yeah, so I, I made lifelong friends through that. I think what did make it easier I mean when I was growing up there really wasn't the internet so it was kind of a new thing and most people didn't have it in their homes and I think when I was in university and the use of the internet became even more and more common and it was like so suddenly you couldn't live without it that made things easier for me because that's how I started dating it was through online dating and I found it kind of leveled the playing field for me and really helped um so I would say like absolutely use community groups and everything like that. Facebook groups. That's the best way to cope with this sort of thing. But you know, when I was younger, it was quite a bit tougher than it is now. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Find your people, find your community, yeah. follow true bases. <laughs> so congrats on being a new mom. I think that that is very exciting. So could you tell us a bit about um, the story of how you gave birth? Yeah, so this is a bit of a long story because in addition to my heart condition, I also have some stomach issues that were probably caused by the stomach tube that I had growing up because I was laying down and getting food that way. I ended up developing really bad reflux. And this is something that I have every day of my life. And unfortunately, this is also something that is generally really bad in pregnancy. Um, not to mention that I also ended up getting a bladder infection when I was in my late twenties that caused permanent damage of my pelvic floor, which causes chronic pain 24 seven. So I walk around feeling like I have a UTI, which is not fun, but I'm so used to it by now that it's funny that I don't even notice it anymore. But you know, these things combined with the heart condition 
and the pass the, the chance that I could pass on this condition to a child were like thoughts that were like, okay, what are we going to do about having children? And I also have a terrible fear of throwing up. Um, that was probably brought on by um, the fact that I threw up every single day until I was about four years old because of the medication I was given for my heart. So I developed this horrible fear of throwing up. Um, I've got the heart condition. I've got this pelvic pain disorder. I've got stomach issues. And I'm thinking there's no way I can be pregnant. Absolutely no way. So when my husband and I um, started talking about having children, I told him, I don't think I'll ever be able to be pregnant, but you know, there is surrogacy. We knew that adoption is really, really difficult in Ontario. So we kind of said adoption isn't probably the right route for us. So we decided on surrogacy. Initially, I was going to use my own eggs. Um, and then what happened was that no clinic, uh, there's very few clinics in Ontario that that are feel comfortable working with a congenital heart patient because the hormones and some of the procedures, for example, like egg retrieval, um, can cause a heart event. Let's put it that way, a cardiac event, not a heart attack, but something where you might need to be rushed to a hospital because fertility clinics generally aren't located in hospitals. So after that, it was like, okay, that's going to be so difficult. There's only two clinics in Ontario that do it. One, the waiting list was way too long. The other was two hours away from home. So I just was like, you know what, let's get an egg donor. So we managed to get an egg donor. We had 11 or 12 embryos made, and then we found a surrogate. So two completely different people. We found a surrogate and it, we were like planning that we did two transfers, it didn't work. And then unfortunately, uh, our surrogate stopped talking to us and uh, ended the relationship, which was heartbreaking because to this day, we don't know what happened. Um, and after that, I said to my husband, I don't think I can go through surrogacy again. I know we still have embryos, but I think I need to try this myself. Um, so anyway, up comes March 2020 with the pandemic starting and we had gone to my doctors and they had all said, you know what, we think your heart condition is stable enough that you can get pregnant, but you're 35 now, you have to get pregnant right away. You don't have much time. And in the meantime, we go back to our fertility clinic and they're like, yeah, don't get pregnant now. It's COVID, we don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> all that. So we're thinking at that time, COVID's going to be like two, three months, right? We didn't think it was going to be mm -hmm. over a year already and probably another year before things are at least somewhat back to normal. So, you know, we were like, okay, well, let's just wait a couple months and see. We get to like May, June, we're like, no, this is not ending anytime soon. COVID might not be over until my fertility levels plummet. So let's start trying and see what happens. And uh, three weeks later, I was pregnant. <laughs> So that was kind of unexpected and a shock. And I went into panic mode because even though I was given the green light and it was okay, and I had the supports put in place, it felt, I didn't expect it was going to happen that fast and I wasn't prepared. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, I panicked to the point where I was like, I don't think I can go through this. And there isn't the mental health support for people who let's say have the fear of throwing up because immediately after I got pregnant, I, like two days after I took a pregnancy test, I was nauseous to, you would not believe. And I was like, oh no, this is really happening. I'm going to throw up. And so I called my doctor in a panic. I'm like, get me on meds. And then it took me about four weeks to finally say, you know what? I really want this enough that I think I can push through it. And I did. <laughs> um, and it was a very, very difficult pregnancy from my point of view, from my hospital and my doctor's point of view, they all thought that I did amazing because nothing medically traumatic happened to me. Like nothing, my heart stayed strong through the whole thing. It did not have any trouble at all supporting the pregnancy. Um, and the baby, everything was fine with the baby. So we had like a fetal echo done the baby did not inherit the heart condition. Um, it went really well from a medical standpoint. From my standpoint, every day was like, why did I do this? <laughs> um, so it, it was very difficult. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't get the break from the nausea after the first trimester. I had it the entire pregnancy. I had planned to have a C-section because 
uh, even though my heart, they said with my heart, I didn't need to, my heart was strong enough to withstand a birth. I was kind of just like, you know what, um, because of the pelvic pain, there is the risk that if you have a vaginal birth, that it can make things worse. So uh, they said it's less likely with a C-section. So I booked a C-section and it was supposed to be when I was about 39 weeks. I got to 36 weeks and I'm like, I don't think I can do this anymore. Like this baby has to come out. And they said, okay, well, it's still a little early and it still would be, she would still would be premature by this point, but let's see if we can move it up. They moved it up to 37 weeks and three days. And on February 8th, our daughter Hannah was born. <laughs> Yay. I love the name. Yes. 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 Great name. Yes. I have to ask, is it Hannah with an H or with, with the H at the end or with a PH at the end? With the H at the end. Yes. That's the only way to go. Now exactly. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So Hannah was born. Um, no issues except the fact that because she was a little bit early and was born by C-section, she did have fluid in her lungs that had to be cleared. Um, so she had to go to the an ICU for two days and had some help with breathing. Of course, me being, you know, having seeing that she's having trouble breathing when she's born and thinking, oh, my God, this is happening for another generation. I freaked out, even though they kept assuring me, no, this is normal. She'll be OK in a couple days but it was very hard for me. Um, and I didn't really see her the day she was born. I mean, I was a mess with the C-section, all that. And then they took her off to the NICU and I was like, what happened to my baby? Um, but, <laughs> but after that, we, you know, she, we came home, she's been great. She had some feeding issues at first, but now she's eating very well and she's now two months old. So, and I survived the pregnancy with as far as I know, no complications. I'll be going in for some more cardiac tests in about two months. But right now, everything is good. That is so amazing. With all of the challenges that you had growing up, I'm glad that it went so well. Like, <laughs> I don't think it could have gone much better. And that's, that's really great. Mm -hmm. So with everything that has happened, I don't know how many people may be in a similar position, but uh, if there is someone in a similar position, what kind of advice would you give them? Uh, well, I think for everything, um, you know, again, I mentioned that the internet wasn't exactly much of a thing when I was young. And even when I was a teenager, it wasn't quite that accessible at that point. Uh, I didn't know how to use the internet. I remember being the only person in my grade nine class that put up my hand when they asked, does, does anybody not know how to use the internet? And I put up my hand <laughs> and it was very embarrassing. Um, but uh, I'd say that, you know, even though Facebook and Instagram can sometimes have harmful, um, you know, effects because of bullying and stuff like that, there's also, you can find some of the greatest friends you've ever had. And you can meet amazing people through those avenues. If you look up hashtags like um, for example, if one of mine is like CHD survivor, genital heart disease survivor, you look that up, you'll find like-minded people, you'll find a community out there that um, you can speak to. Also, you know, through your doctors have some great resources. And I mean, it's not always the easiest dealing with, you know, medical professionals, but sometimes, for example, if you go to congenital heart clinic, there's brochures for other, you know, other groups and stuff like that and communities that meet and they're still continue to meet online, even with the pandemic. I mean, everybody knows Zoom is absolutely essential now. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, asking around, talking to your doctors. And another thing to mention is that for people who've had a lot of medical issues like myself, there is a lot of trauma that you have to process. And so I definitely have medical post-traumatic stress disorder. So, I mean, going to the hospital for Hannah's birth was definitely very difficult for me because of everything I've been through. Um, so the thing to remember is that it's always okay to go talk to a therapist, um, a, a social worker, a counselor, a psychiatrist. Um, they can be extremely helpful as well because chances are if you're in a similar situation, you are going to have some anxiety. You might have some depression. You might It might pop up in other ways, but... It generally, they found that people with congenital heart defects do have mental health issues like anxiety and depression. So there's never any harm to talk to someone. Talk to, if you're not comfortable talking to a professional, talk to a friend first. Um, but, you know, there are professionals out there nowadays, especially with the pandemic, a lot of free mental health services available. So you can take advantage of that, um, all kinds of stuff. And it's just really important to reach out and, you know, meet others and just 
talk about your situation and it really does help. Absolutely. Totally agree. Finding that community base, other people who know what you're going through and definitely just, just talking about it can be so beneficial in so many Mm -hmm. ways. Excellent piece of advice. Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for talking with us today. Your story is absolutely incredible. And we're so happy to be able to share it on our channel. I love listening to you talk. You're, you're a fabulous speaker. And I know you also do the What's the Difference podcast with Sarah, who we interviewed last week. And so we'll definitely link that down below if anybody wants to he- hear more of Jackie. But once again, thank you so much, Jackie, for coming to yeah. chat with us today. <laughs> And thank you both for having me, Emily and Hannah. Obviously, I was very excited when I saw your name was Hannah because (laughs) there's a good reason for that. So thank you again. And thank you for the work that you're doing as well. Thank you so much. And thank you guys for watching. We will see you later. Bye.